Amen. What a blessing. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was really, really a blessing. It's great to see everyone today. I'm uh, so excited to be back uh, preaching the word. Uh, excited to see young people here today. Middle-aged folks. Some seniors in the house. And uh, we are kicking off the fall at Antioch Bible Church. And as far as the preaching goes, we will be walking through the book of Ephesians. I'm so excited for this journey. Uh, I've titled the series, Rich in Love. And as we uh, embark on this fall journey, I just want to start with a word of prayer. I just want to give this fall to the Lord. I know that September, October, November, December, it's going to be very exciting. I have the mentality and mindset of moving forward. I know that uh, God is going to take us to places that I'm not aware of yet, but it's going to be absolutely amazing. And uh, before we start, I just want to pray. And I want to pray for you too, because I know that each person here is going through a different circumstance. People here are in unique seasons of life, and I know that you would appreciate um, a prayer, so I want to pray for you as well. So before we start the message and this new series in Ephesians, uh, let's give the fall over to God and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for everyone who is here today. Lord, uh, thankful for the young people Lord, who are here today, I see them in the audience, and I just want them to know that they are special and that Jesus loves them so much, as is evident throughout the scriptures. Lord, even as parents of uh, young people, Lord, Father, I just want to pray for them, Lord, as they start back in school, Lord, and meet new friends and have new teachers, Father, we just pray a blessing over our young people that you will protect them. And Lord, even at a young age, that they would feel your presence, that they would know that you've put them out of school for a specific purpose, that you've placed the parents that they have in their lives for a specific purpose. And Father, I just want to pray a blessing and protection over our young people this fall. Lord, Father, I pray for the college age group, the young adults. Father, as they're navigating different seasons and transitions in their life, Father, I pray for them as they start making decisions that will set the stage for their future. Father, I pray that they're in their word, Lord, that they're in prayer, that they don't succumb to the temptations or the wildness of this world, but, Father, that they are rooted and grounded in you. Lord, Father, I pray for husbands and wives. Father, I pray for singles. Father, I pray for households. Father, that you will bless the households, Lord that you will bless the single person, that you will bless the marriages at our church. Father, that we will please you in everything that we do. And Father, I want to pray for our seniors as well. I'm just so thankful for them. Lord, I'm so thankful for their commitment and their model to us younger people. Lord, Father, I thank you for their perseverance. Lord, I thank you for their lives. Lord, I thank you that they are still encouraged to keep on going, that you still have a plan for them, that even in their older age, that you are not done with them, Father. So, Father, I pray for a renewed sense of purpose, Lord, over our, our seniors. And Father, this fall, there is 
So much going on at our church, Father. We know we are moving office spaces. Father, we are looking for opportunities to fellowship outside of Sunday. Father, I pray that you create those fellowship opportunities, Lord, that we are not a Sunday-only church. Father, I pray for opportunities to gather and pray. Lord, that people from our church will want to gather and pray and that the temperature of prayer will be raised in our church this fall. So, Lord, as we open your word, as we are so privileged to have the scripture translated in our own language that we can understand, Father, we bow before you and we give this sermon series and we give this fall season to you. And Lord, as you do amazing works, may we look back on this prayer that started the amazing journey of this fall. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, let's turn your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. We will be in Ephesians chapter 1 today, verses 1 through 14. The title of the message today is Blessings on Blessings. You are going to feel very blessed after this sermon today. And Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. So let me give you a introduction to the city of Ephesus and the book of Ephesians. Ephesus was located in Western Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. So if you want to place it on the map, it's Western Turkey, modern day, and it's located by the Aegean Sea. A major factor of wealth and prominence of the city was due to its location as a seaport and also due to the Temple of Artemis or Diana. The temple for this fertility goddess was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. And that was located in Ephesus. The Apostle Paul, he had a brief encounter in Ephesus in Acts chapter 18. He had a missionary journey going on and he stopped briefly in the city of Ephesus and he reasoned with the Jews in the synagogues and the Jews asked him to stay, but he declined. And he said, I will return to Ephesus if it's the Lord's will or plan. So after this planting this initial seed, the Lord did bring Paul back to Ephesus and he spent three years there and had a very fruitful ministry. You can read about this in Acts chapter 19. You may recall that in Ephesus, many magicians, they brought their magic books and they publicly burned them. And it was estimated to be worth 50,000 pieces of silver. That happened in Ephesus. Also, Demetrius, the silversmith, who made the silver shrines of Artemis, he was losing business because Paul was calling people to repent from lowercase g gods. And Demetrius led this riot in Ephesus where the people cried out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. That also happened in Ephesus. So several years later, after leaving Ephesus, approximately five or ten years later, Paul was able to write a letter to this beloved church. He loved these people. He built meaningful relationships with them. When he had to leave Ephesus, it was very sad. It was like if I was here for three years 
and then I had to leave. And then I told you guys, by the way, the Lord revealed to me that I will never see your faces again. That was the situation here. And so Paul and the elders, they wept, they embraced, they kissed. Paul departed. But now five, ten years later, he writes them a letter. And the letter was likely written while he was under house arrest in Rome. So this is approximately 60 A.D. So what we're going to do today is we'll read the greeting in verses 1 and 2. And then I want to point out something that I see in the greeting that compelled me to uh, preach this book. And then we will go to the main body of the text, which is verses 3 through 14. And I will give you an outline of the message today. So let's read the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As you read the greeting, you might say, well, that is a basic greeting. But I immediately see a connection between the church at Ephesus and Antioch Bible Church. Do you see the connection? The connection is to the saints who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Antioch Bible Church, far before I got here, had a reputation of being faithful to Christ faithful to the word of God, even though it's a pagan, hostile environment, similar to Ephesus. And James Boyce, one of my favorite commentators, gives us helpful insight on what it means to be a saint. You see, to the saints who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Here's what he says. Every Christian is a saint, and every saint is a Christian. Moreover, every true Christian is in some sense separated from the world. It does not mean that we are taken out of the world. That is not the way God operates, but it does mean that we are removed from it in the sense of not really belonging to the world any longer. If we are truly Christ, we have a new nature, a new set of loyalties, and a new agenda. Let me give you an outline of the blessings that you will receive from the Word of God today. First, God the Father chose me in verses 3 through 6. Second, God the Son forgave me in verses 7 through 10. And third, God the Spirit sealed me in verses 11 through through 14. Let's take a look at the first blessing that you will receive from the scripture today, that God the Father chose me in verses 3 through 6. Let's read it together. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. 
In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. So I want to begin this blessing with a question. And it's not a trick question. Just answer it the way you believe it should be answered. And here's the question. Did God choose you to be saved? Did God choose you to be saved? I would answer, absolutely, God chose me to be saved. The scripture says clearly in verse 4 that God chose us before the foundation of the world. So before God created the heavens and the earth, he chose you to be saved. You might say, how is that even possible? That's just mind-blowing. And what would make him choose me out of all people, because he didn't choose everyone. But God chose me to be saved. Verse 5 says that he predestined us for adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ. The word predestined means to predetermine or to determine in advance. So God chose you and determined in advance that you would be saved. Predestination is a link in the unbreakable golden chain of Romans chapter 8 verses 29 through 30, believers in Christ were foreknew, they were predestined, they were called, they were justified, and they were glorified. Let me take this a step further to help you understand how huge of a blessing this is that God chose you. God chose you to walk the narrow road that leads to life. Well, many are traveling by the wide road that leads to destruction. The scripture says that only a few find the narrow road. Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. The International Mission Board, known as the IMB, estimates that only 10% of the world's population is saved. Only a few find it. It's mind-blowing that God chose you out of all people to be one of the elect or the 10% to inherit the kingdom of God. How blessed are you today? You are blessed beyond measure that God would choose you. And I want to ask another question as you reflect on this rich blessing that God chose you. Did you choose God to be saved? God chose you. Did you choose God to be saved? Absolutely. You did choose God. When you heard the word of truth and believed in the gospel message of Jesus Christ, at that moment you made that free will decision, you were saved. In God's sovereign plan for humanity, 
He gave man the free will to make decisions. Judas Iscariot made a choice to betray Christ. Pontius Pilate made a choice to crucify Christ. And both men will be responsible for those decisions. And you are also responsible for your decisions. And this is all part of God's eternal plan. Respected pastor and theologian Charles Swindoll said, but how do God's sovereign choice and my free will decision fit together? He responded, the answer is easy. I don't know. <laughs> Nor does anyone else. God's sovereignty and human responsibility work together in a way that no man or woman can fully comprehend. And you know what? Our role is not to figure this out. We don't have to pledge allegiance to a certain theological camp. Our role is stated in verse 6 to praise God for his glorious grace of salvation. So I want to ask you, when is the last time that you thanked God for choosing you? When is the last time that God's grace of his salvation towards you has taken your breath away? This is, should be our focus to praise God for his glorious grace. God the Father, he chose us for salvation. And our salvation was made complete when God the Son shed his blood on the cross for our sins. This takes us to the second blessing you will receive from the scripture today. God the Son forgave me. In verses 7 through 10, we can dwell that God chose me. God, thank you so much for choosing me. Lord, I understand that not everyone has been chosen, but God, out of your grace, you chose me, and I say thank you. You chose me unto salvation. And my salvation is made complete by your son, Jesus Christ. Let's pick up in verses 7 through 10. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. In all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. The word uh, rich or riches continually pops up throughout the book of Ephesians. To be rich is very desired in our culture. When we think about riches, we naturally think about money and earthly riches. Pastor Warren Wearsby made this comment. The fact that Paul is writing about riches would be significant to his readers because Ephesus was considered the bank of Asia. When you are born again, you are born rich. That should certainly be a t-shirt, born rich. And I'll reach out to one of the young people and grab their gold chain and rock that gold chain with my black born rich shirt. 
Maybe it should be a you skit or something like that. Born rich, we got to see it. But when you are born again, you are born rich. I don't know if it's a Christian song, but it should be one. When you put your faith in Christ, you see in verse 8 that Christ lavishes us with spiritual riches. And that we are given full rights as sons and daughters to a wealthy inheritance. You want to talk about being rich. The scripture has something to say about this. You know, I put my faith in Christ when I was 16 years old. Maybe some of you can relate. Maybe you put your faith in Christ as a teenager. There are some teenagers here today who may be 16 years old. And I'm just so thankful that Christ forgave me of my sins. Do you guys feel the same way? You reflect back like B.C. days before Christ when you were really acting a fool and Christ forgave you of all those sins. I remember I was in Snoqualmie, Washington, in the mountains on a church retreat with Calvary Chapel of Tacoma. And I was focused on all the things that the world had to offer. Sports, grades, friends, girlfriends, those types of things that a 16-year-old boy is thinking about. And God just grabbed my attention. He said, Herb, you, you, you think you might have everything, but there's really something missing in your heart and in your life, and that's me. And I was by myself in a back pew, and I bowed my head and gave my life to Jesus Christ right there. I said, God, I need you. God, I am a sinner, and I do believe that Jesus died for me, so save me today. And I remember on the bus ride back, I still have the piece of paper. I'm a journaler, so I wrote down best day of life. And in that piece of paper, I said, I'm so glad to be a clean, repentant Christian. Are you glad to be a clean, repentant Christian? I often reflect on the parable of the two debtors in Luke 7. See, there was this one man who owed 500 days wages, over one year of a salary. And then there was this other man who owed 50 days wages. And Jesus was talking to Peter and he said, so Peter, one owes 500, one owes 50. And then the money lender cancels the debt of both men. Peter, which man do you think will love him more? The one who owed 500 days wages or the one who owed 50 days wages? Peter said, well, I suppose the person who had the greater debt canceled of 500 days wages will love him more. Jesus said, yes, you have judged rightly. For me, in my teen years, I may have not been the chief sinner of Tacoma, but I had my fair share of rebellion against God. And so for me, one reason why I love God one reason why I'm passionate about God, one reason why I have zeal for God is because he has forgiven me of so much. How has God forgiven you? Maybe it's 50 days wages. Maybe it's over a year of wages. But as I reflect back on how he has forgiven me. I'm just compelled to live for him. 
you know, in middle school or high school or even in my early college years, I wouldn't have been voted to be most likely to be a pastor. So some of the people that know me from way back in the day, if they see that I'm a pastor, they would say, wow, what happened to him? God has changed my life. And you can argue about religion all day. But one thing you can't argue is a changed life. And that's what happened when God the Son forgave me. And my wife, who's sitting right here, she said something this week that really touched my heart. She said, Herb, I love you because you never want to do anything that's contrary to the word of God. And that really meant a lot to me. But in all reality, even though the Lord has given me a heart of obedience, I still fall short. Pastors do sin. I remember listening to my former pastors talking about their sin. I'm like, you... What kind of sin do you do, right? You probably got something like holy sin or something like that. Like you ain't really sinning the same way I'm sinning. Like there's different levels to this sin. Well, but I'm here to tell you that, hey, I fall short just like you. And I'm thankful that God has forgiven my past sins, but also my present sins. I'm thankful for God forgiving me for my sins this week. How many of you sinned this week and fell short and you say, God, thank you so much for forgiving me this week. Lord, thank you so much for forgiving me this morning. Lord, thank you so much for forgiving me for next week and next month and 2022. And see, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, that was one payment that was effective for your sins, past, present, and future. In the Old Testament, you had to keep on giving sacrifice over sacrifice every time you would sin. But Jesus Christ is that one atoning, perfect sacrifice. Jesus has separated our sins as far as the east is from the west. Psalms 103, 12. And to secure our salvation, we have been sealed for redemption. This brings us to our third blessing that we will receive from the scriptures today. That God the Spirit sealed me in verses 11 through 14. Oh, Lord, Father, thank you for choosing me, Lord. Thank you for forgiving me. And now, Lord, thank you for sealing me. In verse 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Mm. See, we were saved to give God praise. And in verse 13, I love the phrase, the gospel of your salvation. Do you see it? The gospel literally means good news. The gospel is easy to understand. You know the gospel, you know the good news. You were once a sinner, but Jesus died for your sins. He paid the penalty for your sins. And when you put your faith in Jesus, 
that he died and rose again, you will be saved. You will be rescued from sin and its ultimate consequence of hell. This is the gospel. The gospel can be explained by using the ABCs. It's simple. Any of you can share the gospel. I was talking to my father-in-law and he said, Herb, I'm not so sure many people have even had a clear gospel presentation. Well, you can just use the ABCs. A, admit. Admit that you're a sinner. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Maybe the Lord will open a door for you to share the ABCs with a coworker. Maybe the door will open, maybe God will open a door for you to share the gospel at school or at a business that you frequent. A, admit that you are a sinner. B, believe that Jesus died for you and rose again. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. A, admit, B, believe, C, confess. Romans 10, 9, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. People need to hear good news. There's a lot of bad news right now. You might say, I need to go home and check up on the news. Turn on the news channel or look at the news on your phone. You might be discouraged after checking the news. You might go down a rabbit trail of discouragement. But people need to hear good news. You can tell someone, hey, I have good news. You can text someone good news. You can post on social media some good news. Let me tell you about some good news. The gospel of your salvation. I asked my youngest son, Theo, who's five years old. I said, uh, Theo, what is the gospel? He said, Jesus. He said, it's all about Jesus. Even a child can understand. But we need to share this gospel of our salvation. When you hear the gospel and believe, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. So Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 is my go-to passage on eternal security. You might say, what is eternal security? It's the doctrine that a Christian cannot lose salvation. To be sealed, you see it in verse 13, the word sealed. That word indicates security and permanency. Let me explain. Pontius Pilate sent a guard of soldiers to make the tomb secure by sealing the stone. In the book of Esther, King Artaxerxes told Mordecai that an edict sealed with the king's signet ring cannot be revoked. If the seal of a Persian king cannot be revoked, the seal of the Holy Spirit is certainly permanent. The Holy Spirit has, quote, unquote, sealed the deal for your salvation. So the Holy Spirit is a guarantee or down payment of your inheritance in heaven. You see that in verse 14. So if you have the Holy Spirit, you are going to heaven. 
So for those of you who know that the Holy Spirit resides in you, that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not talking about speaking in tongues. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit as your advocate, as your guide. If the Holy Spirit resides within your bodily temple, if you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, which is clear as day, you either do or you don't. But I have good news for every believer in Christ who has been sealed with the Holy Spirit. If you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit resides in you, you are unequivocally, without a doubt, going to inherit the kingdom of God in heaven. See, the Holy Spirit is a guarantee. It's a down payment. The Holy Spirit is the first installment of your inheritance in heaven. See, we live by faith, but God said, let, let me give you a down payment of your inheritance in heaven. The Holy Spirit that resides in you is my pledge that you will inherit eternal life. And God, the Holy Spirit, is not one who will default on his guarantees. So as we conclude this message today, I want to give you an exercise where you can praise God for his blessings. We have to exercise our spiritual muscles throughout the week. Many of us know the importance of physical exercise, and we try to make that a priority in our lives, for better or for worse. But we also need spiritual exercise. So this exercise is to praise God for his blessings. As you see in this text, you are very blessed. God chose you. God forgave you. God sealed you. And our response is to praise God. You see it in verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace. In verse 12, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So I want to give you a couple exercises for this week where you can praise God. You can exercise those spiritual muscles. First... I want to encourage you to reread Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, preferably in an unmarked Bible. And I want you to underline and highlight all of the ways that God has blessed you. And after you've done that, have a time of reflection and have a time of praising God for all of the blessings that you have identified. Maybe that can be a midweek exercise on Wednesday or another day you choose. And then secondly, I want to encourage you to pay attention to the way God blesses you this week. I'm not speaking to general provisions. I'm talking about specific blessings, specific ways that God blesses you this coming week. And I want you to make a note of those blessings uh, in your phone or on a sticky note or in a journal. And before you come back to praise and worship this coming Sunday, or before you turn on the live stream this coming Sunday. What I want you to do is review these specific blessings. And as you praise God, you will have specific blessings on your mind. And this will make your time of worship richer and more meaningful. 
Church, we praise God that we have been chosen. We praise God that we have been forgiven. And we praise God that we have been sealed. And if you are here today and you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, today is the day for salvation. If you're watching on live stream, maybe you've went to church or you're checking a few churches out, but you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to do that today. And if you do that on live stream, contact us because we want to help you grow in Christ. This faith journey is not meant to be walked alone. And when you are able, come to church. Be a part of this community of believers. So if you are here today, as Nicole sings this final song, I want to ask you to come. We are going to have brothers and sisters here to pray with you. And if you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, if you have never asked Christ to forgive you of your sins, if you do not have the Holy Spirit, why don't you come today and connect with a brother or sister in Christ and pray with them. Yes, during this final song, everyone will be standing, but I want you to act in faith and leave your seat and come forward. Like I said, the faith journey is not meant to be walked alone. You're not too young. You're not too old. You haven't been in church too long to come. Don't let pride or arrogance stop you from coming forward. So we will all stand right now, sing this final worship song. And if you want to come forward, there are brothers and sisters on both sides. And you may already be saved. You may already say, Herb, I know that I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit, but you might have a pressing prayer request. There may be something on your heart today that you really need prayer for. Maybe it's a big decision. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a family affair. Well, I also want to invite you to come. These brothers and sisters in Christ are here to pray with you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Nicole. I hope you guys have a uh, wonderful day. You are so blessed in Christ. You are dismissed. We'll see you soon.